Um, hey, Vin, how you doing? Hi, Matthew. How are you? Ah, not too bad yourself. Are you good? The, yeah, I'm really good. Thanks for inviting me. I'm excited to talk to you. Ah. When you invited me, when we talked about it, I was like, wow, this is going to be what a wonderful opportunity. And then after that, I was thinking of all the people you've talked to, and I'm thinking... <laughs> Uh, uh oh, what could I possibly add to any of these conversations that would be helpful or interesting or, you know, well, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking with you. Um, I, I know you can add an absolute ton of stuff, um, which is hence why I've invited you on. So listen, Finn, I've been a fan of your playing. Um, I think it was Twitter that I uh, first came across your playing. I mean, it's like for some people now, Twitter is like it's almost like the MySpace of you know like if yeah. you know it's like it's for politics and rants and that's it but you've occasionally yeah. you find some brilliant music on there and I remember finding um some stuff you did on there and just been so taken with your playing and um one thing is that you're the first like you're the first steel string player uh, to come on the gallery of guitar I mean I've had electric guitarists or or let's say classical guitarists playing electric and stuff like that on before but right. you're the, you're the first steel string player and it was <laughs> It was like your posture and the way you approached steel string, which people will see in the video and stuff that you've recorded and mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. They'll, they'll see it as soon as it's like you look like a classical player immediately. I mean, if if you weren't like checking the headstock and checking the strings out, you know, you <laughs> might just you might just think, oh, he's a he's a he's a he's a classical player, or he's set up mm -hmm. that way. So, right off the bat, you know, can you tell me a little bit about that? Why is your posture different to like you know the lion's share of steel string players out there? Well, I, I studied classical guitar, so uh, I went to college for a degree in classical music uh, and music education. Yeah. So, you know, I, I spent four years studying classical guitar, and, and I, I've kept that ever since. And, you know, that posture is just, it's just the most natural way to play, I think. Yeah. Because um, yeah. sitting with the guitar on your leg or, you know, it, it's just back problems and all kinds of, you know, yeah. problems yeah. With, with the arms. It just, you know, it always worked for classical players, so why not for steel string players? Yeah. And, you know, I know a lot of players don't do that, but uh, working with Will Ackerman, I know he always played with a footstool. Yeah. And, you know, he's not a classically trained player, but, you know, I know yeah. he does it. I don't I don't know many of others that do it. Some people use a footstool, but for their right leg, which is, yeah. you know, yeah. just a bit of guitar. But, I mean, that, that's, that, you know, form is perfect for, for steel string playing. Definitely. I, I think, I mean, we've got one player um, here in Scotland, Martin Taylor. I mean, he's, he's a great jazz player and he, he right. often sits, you know, it's arched up jazz guitar, but he sits with mm -hmm. it in a classical posture. Uh, he obviously used to, to walk about the stage with a strap and like be like super, you know, like amazing entertainer all over the sort of stage. And, and I think maybe like as he's, he's got on a little bit in years, um, he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's found that sort of fixed posture. And it's, um, it's it, it focuses uh I think the mind of the listener and the ears of the listener quite directly as well, because mm -hmm. you know, you know how you're saying like there, the, the the footstool on the right leg, which is kind of weird, you know, but it just to lift the guitar it up. I think it's it's lifting the wrist up, and it's I, the way the classical posture is. Obviously, it allows for a lot of polyphonic control over all the lines that you're you're doing in classical. And sometimes with steel string, we often think of like, okay, you've you've got chords, you've got lots of block chords, and you're moving them around, especially if you're accompanying. But obviously, you're style of playing is from finger style and then obviously has this because you, your, your compositions are I've got quite a lot of like I think a lot of depth to them and I've played one of your pieces as well in the gallery I, I'd love your the way Thank you, you write that. I love wonderful. the way you write and Thank I think you. I think it sounds like classical guitar music on a steel string guitar a lot of the time mm -hmm. and it's those inner voices that you're paying so much attention to when you play and sometimes if you've got your hand down here we're here in the bass and we're here in the melody and to be honest what's going on in the middle isn't that clear and I'm I'm actually even talking about some really great steel string players who play in different yeah, ways yeah you know the attention yeah, to right, detail I'm kind of I'm mm -hmm. yeah no so I'm, the, I'm neurotic about tone as well and and yeah. that you know really helps and I do a lot of cross string playing yeah. um melody lines cross strings so I'm using open strings all the time whether I'm in alternate tunings or I've really gone back to standard tuning in the last few recordings which I hadn't written in, in forever yeah. um, but trying to maintain that in, in standard tuning as well it just sitting like that just helps me play so much cleaner and yeah. I can just really focus on the tone that way yeah exactly but, yeah and okay. I, I think it's funny that you mentioned that you know uh, uh, someone watching that or listening to a player sitting like that I think it does command a little bit more oh oh what's he going to do a little bit more attention because it's you know it's not so casual i think you know yeah, yeah i totally agree i think 
I mean, I know, I know these kind of things happen naturally when someone sort of addresses a violin or sits down at a keyboard, you know, like a, a classical pianist mm-hmm. or whatnot. Um, and we all do have these associations in our heads. You know, I mean, like I, I you know, played electric guitar, played steel string guitar, played, you know, I, I don't think there's any guitarist on the planet that hasn't had a go at everything, you know, at some point right. in time. Right. Um, and it's just, it, it's, it's fascinating for, for me as a classical player to see your approach to it as a steel string player um, because it, you said when you said neurotic about tone I'm like yeah Mm -hmm. I I know exactly what you mean there and it's it's taking care of every single line and knowing that the I guess the importance of every line and of every voice that you're playing can have such an impact on the music you're making when I watch a lot of really gifted you know virtuoso steel string players there can be such an amazing sense of pulse and sense of time and, and, and some of the things that are going on are just incredibly impressive also though the more and more and more I listen and the more I'm looking for that detail sometimes in those middle voices and things like that, sometimes it is a bit lost even with some of the greatest players. So maybe there's right. something down to, you know, th- th- this posture and this angle, I don't know. But uh, I think it really helps, you know, yeah. I, I, especially for those inner voices. Yeah. You know? yeah. And I, I want people to really pay attention to that stuff, you know, because when you're writing that way, you think like, oh, there's this great line in between all these other things, between yeah. the bass and the melody. I, I want people to hear that and pay yeah. attention to it. So. Yeah got to be done cleanly yeah it's not just and i think that helps not just call and response it's counterpoint as well and that's kind of you know right like you know, I, I think sometimes the, the key to sort of really enjoying a melody more especially if, it, if it's repetitive and stuff like that so sometimes sure. as, as, with, with maybe some types simpler forms of writing it's something that mm-hmm. misses it's like how you treat that that melody differently the second time and sometimes it's just shaping that counterpoint you know um, right right so listen sorry we digressed because i was you know it, 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 the posture thing was something that i knew had come to you right away but um mm. listen this arrived the other day <laughs> nice i'm glad it made it there <laughs> yeah it's made it all the way all the way from new jersey uh to glasgow in scotland and um, so three evenings literally just released which is why i also wanted to have you on and um, the, st- the, the, the piece that you've curated for the Gallery of Guitar, mm-hmm. The Tree Still Thinks of Tom, which is on, on this album, obviously, in your, right. in your, in your studio performance, but you've done a, a, a really special one for us, which is great. Mm-hmm. So can you tell me about, about that piece, of course, because that's what everyone's going to sure. listen to, uh, right. and also the album? It, it's a really short piece, maybe a minute and a half, really short, but... Um... I really like that piece. I'm really proud of that piece. And th- there's a story behind it, um, The Tree and Tom. Tom Eaton is uh, a dear friend of mine. He's also the engineer and producer I work with. He uh, works with okay. Will Ackerman, and now I, I record with him at his own studio uh, up in New Hampshire now. Tom had lived in Massachusetts for years in Newburyport, which is on the northern coast of Massachusetts. Okay. And there's this beautiful state park right on the beach up there. And he would you know, go out for walks and meditation, just relaxing on this beach and there's this one tree sort of in this pasture all by itself and for some reason he just you know was drawn to that tree and he would always take pictures on his walks and he'd throw them up on his instagrams or whatever and you know over like a couple of years i guess he was always taking pictures of this one little tree that he would refer to as tom's tree and he had you know dozens and dozens of pictures of this one lone tree going through all the seasons so oh, nice. last last year, uh, Tom and his wife uh, found a beautiful old home up in New Hampshire. So they moved. So he's not taking his walks at the state park anymore, mm-hmm. and you know, sort of misses that. So I just wanted to write something. I lo- I love the the you know, giving the tree a persona and and having the nice. tree think about well, where's Tom? You know, I I think yeah. about him often. So it's <laughs> something nostalgic and 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 you know, I, I really like it. it's a short little piece, but I nice. think it really kind of takes you to a place and and. and you know, yeah, I love the, I like it. I, yeah, yeah, I love the fact that it has that narrative as well. I mean, it's something that sometimes is kind of, it's a little bit missing um, in other types of composition. You know, like you know, it, it, it's it's written with that that story in mind. You're telling that story mm-hmm. musically, and it's something really personal. Right. I absolutely love it. And um, thank you so much for recording it for the gallery. At the end of this uh, at this chat that we're having, everybody's going to go and they're going to they're going to go and, and listen to your, your your beautiful performance. So tell me, how does it? Cool. Um, how does it fit in with the rest of the album? And tell me about three evenings. What's what, what's going um, on with the whole with the whole record? Well, the record it, it's twelve songs, and uh, eight of them are are new that I've written in the last year, and five of them I've taken from my last two releases, which were only digital releases. Okay. And three evenings I obviously put out on CD, so I wanted to add some of those songs uh, that weren't on a CD. Mm-hmm. Um, but the entire record. Ex- 
is in standard tuning, which is unusual for me. I, mm. I haven't really written in standard tuning in, you know, forever, really. I mean, mm -hmm. most of my records, my first, well, my first record's in standard, but that was more bluesy and folksy. Okay. Uh, when I started working with Will Ackman, I was really exploring lots of different uh, alternate tunings. So I kind of lived there for a few records. And um, a lot of people use the alternate tunings to sort of get out of, you know, being jammed into standard tuning where you you know everything starts to sound the same and yeah. you're going to familiar patterns and yeah but i was in alternate tunings for so long i felt myself having the same problems i felt like i was painting myself into a corner with alternate tunings exactly and you know i i used several you know 12 or you know 12 or 13 different tunings but i was still finding myself going to the same things mm. so i figured well let me try something new and go back to standard and which was really hard at first to sort of write in standard but maintain the things i was doing in alternate tuning like using lots of open strings and getting uh the resonance of those tunings but in standard yeah so um typically what i do is i'll tune the guitar down a half step leave it in standard but go down to e flat okay nice um, so that entire record is is um in standard there's yeah. one song in drop d but um okay yeah it's uh a lot of the this most of the well i guess all of the songs that i wrote for this i kind of wrote over the last year and I write them in school, you know, cause I, I teach high school. So I go in early in the morning and I give myself a good hour before anybody gets into the building. And I sort of got into the habit of writing every day. And yeah. um, I remember a lot of you, these pieces came from that. I remember you putting some clips up, you know, just, yeah. just, just of like, this is a gap between students or this is like, you know, some, yeah, some, yeah. someone's basically skipped class. So therefore I can, I can write something or I can, uh, like right, a, it's, a little idea, you know? Yeah, it's before school, lunch, prep, whatever, you know, because I have yeah. the guitar in my hand all day long. So I want to try to be productive, you know, even mm -hmm. though I'm productive in school, but also, you know, yeah. use the time to to write some stuff. And even, you know, a lot of the, the short pieces I wrote for that, the study book um, mm -hmm. came out of that as well. And mm -hmm. I also started um, a newsletter every month through my website where each month I just uh, I'll give everybody a free piece. So I'll write a very short piece of music every month and you know uh, give out the notation and tabs for that yeah nice um, so a couple of those pieces actually came from those free pieces short pieces that oh, i just kind okay. of built up a little bit more lovely um, and made them a little bit longer um, yeah 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 ah, so nice. I'm, I'm proud of the record I, I think it i think the general flow of the record works really well and yeah. I, i'm still somebody who loves records you know yeah. uh listening to an entire album to see the arc of the record and, and where it takes you yeah like the whole single thing nowadays is kind of confuses me it's yeah it's kinda, frustrating yeah. it's yeah you can do I mean, a lot of things can work with no context and sometimes just can, completely can't you know and um and take on all sorts of different contexts you know when you just mm. hear them as, as as separate things or embedded in really random playlists you know and, and stuff like that so right. it's it's it, it is nice to hear something i mean i put it on and it just when you said flow or arc or something like that it mm -hmm. just has a really gentle uh, build to it and it just kind of like falls away towards it it's, it's gorgeous i mean it's 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 a really beautiful it. record Thank you. really really impressed actually and it's so Thank nice you. that you um you have a piece dedicated to the producer on it as well so you know the tree still thinks of tom and tom eaton being the producer. Yeah. have you worked with him I, for a long time yeah um like i said tom has worked with will ackerman for a number of years and okay. will ackerman was the founder of windham hill records if anybody's familiar with windham hill that was yeah. the, the huge instrumental record company 70s 80s into the 90s mm -hmm. um enormous um mm -hmm. so tom's worked with will for i guess maybe since 2012 or something mm -hmm. uh i first recorded with will and tom uh 2013 i started working with them mm -hmm. and tom and i tom is an incredible composer musician he's a piano player keyboard since all that stuff plays ah, bass okay. plays guitar he plays a little of everything right brilliant 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 composer and as an engineer he's just a genius i mean <laughs> the guy is just a genius uh to to get the sound i mean for, in acoustic music he is he's the guy yeah okay. um, but we really clicked when we first started working together i think we share a lot of the same music musical sensibilities nice so he's very comfortable to work with and i think we just make a really great team mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah, it's, I, I can't imagine recording with anybody else at this point, yeah. you know, it's so nice. he just knows me well enough to yeah. make it really easy to work in the studio. Yeah. You know? It's, it's sort of gold when you find someone like that, you know, that you can, yeah. that you can totally trust and that you have this working relationship with that you can be so comfortable in and so proud of, you know, because I think a lot of people don't necessarily know 
the role of a producer or like they, they think it's right. kind of uh, it's a super commercial sort of corporate music business kind of thing but actually like mm. you know um, like I work with Uros uh, Baric a lot who's an incredible mm-hmm. Slovenian guitar player in his own right mm-hmm. but he also is like you know the owner of a record studio and he's a great engineer and it's um it's a friend, you know, and it's a musical friend as well. It's someone that, like, if you didn't record the records with them, you might end up playing music with them or you might end up right. being in other, you know, types of partnerships with them artistically. It's uh, mm-hmm. it's it's finding someone who actually, you know, isn't just sitting going, well, I can get this from A to Z or A to B. Do you know what I mean? It's someone right. who really cares about what you're doing. I mean, you can hear that. Right. You can hear. It's, 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 yeah. it's such a nice, uh, it's such a nice relationship that you've obviously got musically, so... Congratulations. And what you said, thank you. Uh, what you said about trusting, I mean, that that's the big thing, being able to trust the person you're working with. Because for myself, I mean, I'm I'm my own worst horrible critic. I mean, I would just trash everything that I do. You know, it's just <laughs> never, ever clean enough. It's never good enough. And I fully yeah. trust Tom now to just tell me, nope, we got it. That okay. was it. Or, or change something in the composition, too. I really trust him to say, well try the phrase this way or end the phrase that way or add one note here or one note here and it's amazing he has such great ears that it could be something as simple as literally one note in a phrase yeah. he would say change it or do it this way and it completely changes the song you mm-hmm. know or the mm-hmm. piece of music or the you know it, it's amazing yeah. so being able to trust somebody like that oh it's wonderful it's yeah. just it's yeah yeah. Well, you can also you can also tell that you've got great ears as well that's that's in evidence throughout the, the whole recording so Back there, you mentioned, um, I think when you were talking about like writing and, and finding time to write at school and stuff when you're teaching, you mentioned the study book. And this is when you wrote the 10 studies for classical mm-hmm. guitar, right? Okay, so tell me right. about this. Mm-hmm. Tell me about the, the teaching you do and, and the classical guitar teaching you do and, and beyond the, 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 the guitar orchestras mm-hmm. you've got there and stuff. That's another thing that, you know, really drew me to sort of your output as a musician um, when I sort of, mm-hmm. you know, started spying on you after meeting you on Twitter. <laughs> um, what, what? Tell me about that. Like, you know, so the study book and, and mm-hmm. the guitar orchestras and stuff. Okay. Uh, well, I've been teaching in public schools since 1995. And the first 17 years, 17 years of teaching, I did general music. Uh, in elementary schools here. And our elementary schools go pre-K to grade 8. So you're talking 4-year-olds to 14-year-olds. Okay. And I did everything from general music class to teaching choir uh, to teaching band. You know, And every year of that, I would ask my supervisor, you know, could I please start a guitar program? Even in the elementary school, please let me start you know, teaching guitar to kids. And my supervisor at that time, she yeah. had known me when I was a high school student because I'm teaching in the same town that I grew up in. So okay. after like 17 years, she finally said, well, there was a guitar class at the high school before school in the morning. It's now defunct. We have a few guitars. I'll send them down to you. So I started a club in the elementary schools for a couple of years. We had a changeover of supervisors and uh, the new supervisor said, well, how would you like to come up to the high school and start a guitar program full time? Just teach guitar all day long. And I was like, that's what I want. That's yeah. that's now we're talking. Yeah. So 2012, I started that. And um I was still I was teaching choir at the high school, which I was I didn't like that. But I was also teaching guitar, so you got to do a little bit of this to do a little bit of that. Sure, right? sure. So um, it started with just I think I had three guitar one classes, and they bought me I think twenty five classical guitars. And before I started that school year, I looked at my schedule and I realized that I had like twenty seven kids in each class. So I'm now I'm wow. like great, I'm going to teach guitar, and now I'm like great well how am i going to do this you know how do you teach classical yeah. guitar to th- you know so i yeah, figured well let me yeah yeah, yeah. so i i figured <laughs> that's, that's like let my me idea just... hell <laughs> yeah yeah uh so i thought well i have to do i want to teach like a little bit of rock guitar a little bit of this guitar a little... i figured let me just do classical yeah. guitar everybody's gonna do the same thing i had guitars i had footstools now i had to figure out is there a curriculum out there that was sort of written for classes? Because, yeah. you know, I, I didn't know of anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I found the, the Austin Classical Guitar uh, Group has a something called guitarcurriculum.com. That's so right. So it's, it's online. It's a great curriculum written for guitar teaching guitars to classes. Mm-hmm. So everything is written in trios. Um, it's got great lessons. It has, you know, tons of free music. Um, so I started there and mm-hmm. I, I worked that maybe the first couple of years and then they they had asked me if I could perform with the kids and I was thinking, Ugh, I don't know how I'm going to pull that off. 
but I put something together and I pulled it off. Did all classical music, easy stuff with about 15 kids. The next year they said, okay, well, we can add a guitar two class to the program. So then I had like three nice. guitar one classes and a guitar two. Mm -hmm. So over the years, I've built that up where I have guitar one, two, three, and four. So uh, ideally, a kid can come in as a freshman and take guitar all four years as an elective. Wow. That really doesn't really happen. I'll have kids maybe, you know, th three years. Some kids will stay for four. Mm -hmm. um, but then I sort of took guitar one as just intro. Mm -hmm. And it's all just beginner stuff. It's all classical. They're all playing the way they should mm -hmm. be. Mm -hmm. um, then guitar two, three, and four classes, I make them into ensembles. So okay. they will perform in recitals throughout the year and nice. community performances or whatever. And it's wow. all classical stuff. It's all, you know, I use yeah. guitarcurriculum.com. I use um, Bradford Werner's um, website, Bradford, yeah. which mm -hmm. is great. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Forrest has a great website he with does, all yeah. um, mm -hmm ensemble stuff so i've found all of that free ensemble music yeah and i've been using a lot of that and you know also obviously purchasing uh, scores but you know they do everything from renaissance music to yeah to contemporary stuff yeah so it's it's cool and you know when the kids come in the first thing i tell them like day one of guitar one class i have to tell them okay it's it's there's no taylor swift there's no slayer <laughs> there's no picks there's no you know it, yeah. it's not you have yeah. to sit funny you have to use your fingers we're going to play yeah. music that's sort of yeah. classical and you know at the end of guitar one I'll, they'll get into chords and and learning some pop tunes and i kind of tell them like just stick it out with me because by the springtime you'll have the tools to just go online and print out chord changes for your favorite pop or rock songs and be able to play. And then hopefully if I have 60 beginners a year, if I could shake out like 25 to go on yeah. to guitar two the next year, that's great. That's and then perfect. maybe next guitar three is a little smaller and guitar four is usually about five or six kids. So it progresses and you know, Amazing. it just runs itself because it's high school. The kids want to play guitar. Yeah, I don't yeah, have I to advertise or anything. It's no, just, they see guitar. I'm hitting that, yeah, bang, I yeah, want to do that, right. yeah, exactly. Um, it's incredible, I mean, it is an award-winning guitar orchestra, so, I mean, like, and program, I think, that you've got there. So yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and it's... we have a lot in New Jersey now, and we have a great all-state program, where kids from all the high schools in Jersey, whatever schools have a guitar program, mm -hmm. they can audition for the all-state group, and it's mm -hmm. one ensemble of the best players in the state, and they'll get together, and now, it used to be like one performance, but now it's like three or four performances Brilliant. in the tri-state area, and yeah. now we have an all-national guitar ensemble, which I had, the first year I had one of my students get into, and she flew to Florida and hung out in Florida for a week <laughs> and played with kids from all over the country. Ah, oh, fantastic. So, yeah. it's gaining some momentum over here, yeah. um, oh, which great. is nice. Yeah. Well, hats off to you. Congratulations for working so hard Thank you. to put it together. I mean, it's like inspiring generations of uh, of young people to be involved in music and, and take up the guitar and like you say you're setting them up properly and they, they understand what a classical guitar is and then they get to play right. this music that's you know covering four or five hundred years centuries of, of music because you're doing and it, and it happens songs. all the time right where the yeah. kids will come in and once they get to a level where they can play something they, they get the guitar too and they can play a simple Bach piece yeah. and they're like Whoa. we just did that and it's <laughs> yeah, like exactly. yeah you just did that yeah you know, it's sky's the limit it's amazing so it's it's cool and you know yeah. i don't have many kids that go on to college you know maybe once in a while i'll get one or two that want to pursue music in college Brilliant. but it, it's not even about that it's just to no. get the kids turned on to music and and yeah. tap them into the creative process and to yeah. you know communicate with other people in an ensemble and work oh, the, amount of, the amount of transferable skills that they learn oh, and absolutely. confidence that it gives them is just incredible well fantastic great well done it's, it's amazing so i Thank mean you. You, people can check it out because it's got its own facebook page and all that sort of stuff so yeah, yeah. it's bayonne guitar orchestra yeah yeah yeah, if you go to uh, Instagram, I think it's BHS Guitar. Perfect, perfect. And I don't think we have a Facebook anymore, but we're on Twitter. I don't I don't post on there much. But the Instagram, yeah. I try to post some of the kids' work, and you can go through there and see what we've done over the years. Amazing. Excellent. So if anybody wonders why um, suddenly it got very light again um, over here mm -hmm. in Glasgow, I'm interviewing uh, Vin. Um, is it Vin or Vincent? Can I? What, what I mean, am I? It, it, what would you really... It's Vincent. Vincent, yeah. Well, I, I mean, I... Uh, my name is Vincent, and yeah. you know, all, growing up now, I'm in Bayonne, New Jersey, which is a old kind of you know area of, of New Jersey. Yeah. So growing up, everybody called me Vinny. Okay, and like I never, I never liked that. No, I can imagine. And then I went to college. <laughs> when I got to college, all my professors called me Vince for some reason. Like Vince. I didn't ask them to. They just so then people were referring to me as Vince, and then 
when I started yeah. putting money, the music out, I figured, let me just shorten it down to Vin. And, you know, <laughs> Vincent just sounded like my parents talking to me all the time. I've so, got you. But whatever. I've got Whatever's you. comfortable. I've got you. Well, I just I just had to turn, um, well, I was just, I like, I will always go off at tangents and, and, and different tracks here. But you are at, like, what, about sort of afternoon time in New Jersey just uh, now? Yeah, it is uh, 3.14. Ah, okay. And the nights are drawing yeah. in here in Glasgow. So it's, yeah. it's quarter past eight here and it's getting a bit darker. So... Mm-hmm. If anybody wonders why suddenly we're a bit brighter, um, mm-hmm. I've had to put the lights on. Um, but yeah. uh, if I had a name like Vincent, I'd go by it definitely. But I understand. Yeah, I understand yeah. in New Jersey, Vinny. That would that, yeah, yeah. You have to get away from yeah. it somehow. Yeah, yeah. I can Trying imagine. to convince people that I was actually Irish was you know my whole life was like hard. It's like no, you, you're Italian. You're Vinny. <laughs> Vinny. I'm like, yeah. No, I'm not. I'm you know. So listen, it's funny. This. Um, this Irish connection, this affinity, I mean, I, I could kind of hear it anyway in a lot of your playing. And I mean, obviously, you've, you, you've, you've, you've played some Celtic-y kind of trad stuff as well on, 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 mm-hmm. on steel string. But um, is, there, is there any heritage there then? Any Irish blood or Scots blood? Yeah, or why? My, my father's family's from Ireland. Okay. So he was first generation American. And his parents were deceased before I was born. But, you know, just my father had, was really proud of his, his Irish hood. You know, uh, so growing up, it, it's funny because my, my parents weren't musical at all. Uh, my father, he would, he, I would say he'd torture me because he liked two types of music. He liked doo-wop music from his youth and he liked like straight ahead Irish music. Okay. So, you know, sitting in the back of the car, st- stuck listening to doo-wop my whole life. And then in the house, he would put on the Chieftains or something. That's quite but, an extreme, you know, um, <sighs> you know, sort of contrast. <laughs> You're not kidding. And when I was young, I, you know, I really didn't like either of those yeah, things. Yeah. But as I got older and, and was playing music, I, I realized how wonderful they both are. Mm-hmm. But the Irish, you know, it's, I've always been just drawn to, to Irish music and, and especially like the slow airs and things. Mm-hmm. I just, it's, they're just so beautiful. And I think they really translate well to the guitar, yeah. especially the way I approach the guitar, trying to play, always thinking of trying to be like a singer and not a guitarist yeah. and really, you know, playing songs the way they would be sung. Mm-hmm. Um, but and my wife loves Irish music as well. She's a musician too, mm-hmm. and you know we had. There were many years we would go over to Manhattan. There's the, uh, the Irish Art Center in Manhattan, and we would take mm-hmm. lessons. I would take mandolin or banjo lessons, and she would take nice. tin whistle lessons or flute lessons. And mm-hmm. so it's it's been something I've listened to, for a long time now. And I just it's one of my favorite types of music yeah it's just i think it's just so beautiful and it's obviously transferred over to your compositional style as well it's just it's just it's, it's in there you know because you can hear it i think yeah yeah there's well, there's i mean yeah. there, i mean i'm not saying you're writing sad music but there's a melancholic you know um <laughs> yeah, yeah. sort of nostalgic sort of thing in there that you know mm-hmm. translates i think from from those old years like you're saying you know um, i'm glad that comes across because that's that means a lot to me because i love that music so much how did you get into composition because i'm always I, I mean i know you studied you know formally but like how how did you mm-hmm. sort of think well i'm going to go from just playing this guitar and playing other people's stuff and you know playing on other right. people's records and things like that how did you go to like okay i'm gonna write my own stuff uh i i think even from the the first days I started playing guitar, I always wanted to write music. I mean, I remember the, I don't know, I was playing guitar a couple of weeks. I was like 11 I started at. And I remember just, you know, I was really interested in learning how to read music and music theory. So I kind of taught myself how to read music. And mm-hmm. I remember writing stuff on the stage. I don't know what I was doing, but I was trying to, you know, write. I didn't know what I, I had no clue, but I was writing notes on the staff. And, you know, so from the beginning, I was always interested in that. And, okay. you know, when I was younger, even in, when I started playing guitar, like in high school, I was a metalhead. You know, I played in metal bands. Yeah. I, you know, thrash music was my thing. But I was in bands that we always, we always wrote our own music. And, you know, I even liked the theory part of like heavy metal music, which is like sounds silly, but I was always into creating something. Mm-hmm. And I just loved the creative process. I think from when I was very young, that was like, you know, it was very addicting. The whole mm-hmm. idea of, you know, this thing that you made didn't exist 15 minutes ago. Yeah. And now here it is. Yeah. And, you know, I love that. So I always was into that, you know, since the beginning, I was always trying to write music. And when I was in college, um, I did study, I didn't, you know, major or minor in it, but I did take uh, three or four composition classes Mm -hmm. because we had some really good professors at my school. And I was doing, I was part of the Composers Guild of New Jersey as a student. So I had Mm -hmm. a lot of opportunity to write classical music and have it performed. Nice. um, Which, that was great. But also the experience of that, I think, you know, my head wasn't in that space and okay. being with other composers, 
you know, they, I don't know, they just struck me as people who really wanted to talk about their music, <laughs> you know, and really over intellectualize their yeah, music okay. and mm-hmm. um, especially mm-hmm. contemporary music. Yeah. You know? And yeah. I was the guy who would just get up before my piece and be like, I, I wrote this cause I think it sounds pretty yeah, yeah. or, you know, I, I like wrote it. this cause I think yeah, it yeah. sounds good. I hope you like it. Yeah, you know, it's, yeah. I'm not going to talk about it. Yeah, just yeah. listen to it. So that yeah. kind of turned me off to that, yeah. that mm-hmm. field of composing, but mm-hmm. you know, it's something I still think about trying to get back into, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. But I, I always wrote, you know, and I figured, well, mm. I play guitar, so I must just write for, write for the guitar. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting, you know, what you're saying there, those early, early experiences and also, I guess, you know, opportunities that you had with the um, the Composers Guild. But then also it being sort of like, oh, no, where do I fit in this? Because it's so, yeah, um, you know, it, it's very wrapped up in itself. And, uh, you know, these sort of like 15 minute explanations about why the two minute piece you're about to hear you know sounds the way right, it does and right. you're just like okay this this, this is like four times longer than the actual performance itself you know um, <laughs> right right that happens a lot and it happens a lot i think in and it's a sort of justification of what people are trying to achieve and finding the idea for everybody of like the music speaking for itself that's mm-hmm. that's what we're all sort of surely aiming for you know um with all the things right. that we're, we're trying to do so it's nice you probably didn't maybe that wasn't there at that time at that age it's just like i don't really it's not really working here, right. like you know. But probably it's because your music does connect so strongly with people. I mean, it's yeah, it's. Um, it, I think too. So I sincere. mean, I spent a lot of t- right, and, and you know that's what I kind of go for, and and you know I spent a lot of time as a guitar player. Like I knew I wasn't going to be a classical guitar player, like a you know a guy playing concerts, a concert guitar player, because mm-hmm. I just wasn't good enough for that. And I knew that, and that was fine. After college, I studied with a guy, John Sheehan, who was a dear friend, still is a dear friend in northern new jersey and he was like a roots music guy mm-hmm. like he turned me on to mississippi john hurt and john fahey mm-hmm. and um uh renborn and janch and you know yeah. all, all these great things and that was right after i studied classical music so that was like yeah, yeah. Like, you know so then i kind of took that stuff but i spent a lot of years kind of like oh i want to do this and no no no. now i want to do this <laughs> okay. yeah. no i want to do this i want to play blues i want to play jazz i want to and i got you know i was good at nothing and it, i sort of yeah. had this moment where i was like well i'd like to be really good at something and i need to find my niche like what Mm -hmm. what am i good at and then do that Mm -hmm. right Mm -hmm. and so i think you know my my love of Wyndham hill music Mm -hmm. plus classical music plus all that roots music Mm -hmm. um putting that all together but trying to find my own voice in that stuff yeah and that's where will ackerman came in to really and tom to really help me because they heard something in my music that i don't think i necessarily necessarily heard yeah and they gave me the courage to like yeah you have a voice but Mm -hmm. you have to you know be brave enough to use that voice and pursue it and you know work on it and that was the time where i was like okay this is what i need to work on and all that other stuff well i'll just have to Except the fact that I'm not going to be a great bebop player. It's never going to happen, ever. You yeah, know, but it's probably all kind of... its all in there. This is the thing. I think, like, and probably the, the Tom and Will probably picked up on this as well, is it's like, it's it's all a culmination of all these things. Like, without one of those experiences, you're not right. there. You know, without, not, without having that um, Composer's Guild sort of, like, doesn't quite work here, what's going on in this, or without that classical guitar background and without that, like, you know, snatching time between teaching and all that sort of stuff like you know to be focused and, right. and drive I mean there's some people have some great ideas but they never you know they, they won't work unless all conditions are right and it's like I love right. I love the fact that you were snapping time before prep or going in an hour early and <laughs> grabbing this and then probably like all the arrangements and writing for the kids and, and making music really fun for people all of these things contribute to like your artistic output mm-hmm. and even if you think like it's not actively coming out and a performance or a piece of music it's all mm. there in the background you know like uh, as a subconscious kind of thing I, I think I mean I you know whether or whether or not that's 100% true I don't know but like I always feel with with, with musicians yeah. that these things all these experiences are contributing to what comes out in the wash at the end like you know absolutely yeah you know, right you know I, I, yeah. I, 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 I feel that anyway you know whenever I spend time with other musicians and kind of like you sort of start digging into their their background or how they've got to where they've got to you know they might have dismissed this or dismissed that and I'm sitting there going I can actually hear that like you know I can actually hear that in your in your playing or whatever like you right know, maybe not in the forefront yeah I mean you mind. have to you have to accept all those things and I, and I think you know in the search of your own voice as you know as a composer or as a player 
it will come out you know even if you're trying to be completely original you know mm-hmm. it, it, it's all that stuff is still going to be that nothing is completely original mm-hmm. um but those voices are you know that's important yeah. all that stuff is is important to whoever you are as a you know who are, whatever your voice yes. is yeah 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 you know, i mean i know there are lots of artists that i love that you know they might put out a whole bunch of records and then you get to one record and you're like what is that? that? You yeah. know, I like Kelly Joe Phelps is a great example. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's yeah. an American. Okay. I loved Kelly. Mm-hmm. He's wonderful. And I've had an opportunity to meet him several times. Just, he was a brilliant guy. He actually just passed away not too long ago oh. in May. Yeah. Um, but he, he put out this record. Um, I think it was called Liberty Bell. I can't remember. Um, but, you know, he put all these great solid blues records yeah. out. And then he puts his record out. That is literally just free and atonal <laughs> with slide noise, and people hated it. People went berserk. And then the next record he did was like a gospel record that was just beautiful. And, you know, I'm trying to tell people, like, people I've had this discussion yeah. with who are like, oh, that record was awful. I'm like, but the record after that you love so much would have never have happened if he didn't make this yeah. crazy record because as an artist at that time, that's what he had to say. That's what he had to do. It had to come out in order to get to the next thing. Yeah. And, you know, that's part of that. It's, yeah, you know, all those absolutely. things are in you and it's going to come out somehow. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me a little bit of the um, Pat Metheny record with the, <laughs> oh, with the baritone guitar. I can't even remember the name of it now, but it's all sort of, it's all just like quite like one take kind of things. Just like, yeah, yeah. you know, on baritone guitar, pretty straightforward, but just all just him just kind of, noodling on tunes really like it's really yeah, it almost yeah, feels yeah. like i'm like were we meant to hear this like you know like was this meant right, to be right right was this yeah. actually meant to be released and, and you never know i don't know all the things behind these things sometimes you find out they're released for all sorts of different reasons by record companies but i remember i remember like being really into pat metheny and thinking like i like the really kind of far out stuff the re- like the really the really right. sort of like ex- trying to expand what's going on it's kind of really kind of modern jazz and then like that record being like right it's just like just a strummy guitar record like what is going on this is nuts like, yeah yeah know. yeah um but you know you, you you never know what's going on like with with you never you never know what, right right what people are playing for themselves and what people are playing for the public like you know like what they right what you retire to in the comfort of your own home and play for yourself can be very different to what you're actively putting yeah. out and promoting yep. you know so listen another thing i wanted to ask you about was the guitars that you play um mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like like who they're made by, what they're made of, all that kind of stuff. Like, because you've got some absolutely beautiful instruments, and we might not see it on this interview because you know the two of us are occupying the screen, so we've got to right. share it. Yeah. But if you normally see Vin in his room where he records his videos and stuff, his music room, there are just cases lined up. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. Yeah. There's like I can count ten, twelve, probably more than that. But you've got yeah, yeah, yeah. You're too many. Making me jealous. There are too you know, many. Making me jealous. Yeah. Nah. I need to thin the herd because I, there's nothing worse than guitars that sit in cases that don't get played, right? That's True. there's nothing worse True. than that. So I've been thinking, of, I need to get rid of some of these. Uh, <laughs> the main guitar I use is a Furch or Furk, F-U-R-C-H. It's a Czech company. Ah, nice. um, they they it's a parlor size guitar, so it was a custom mm-hmm. build for me, um, and I love it because I like the smaller size bodies. Um, mm-hmm. It's uh, Alpine spruce and African mahogany. But as a, um, it's this one right here. Gorgeous. So it's, and yeah. it, it's a deep body. So the body is is deeper than an ordinary parlor guitar. So yeah. that guitar sounds enormous. Okay. Um, and I, I think I received that in 2016. And I, like the week before I was recording, um, won the C let's go that album Mm -hmm. and i literally just got the guitar a week before and i wasn't ready to play because i hadn't spent any time on it but i brought it with me and i played a couple things for tom who was the engineer and he was like stop that's the guitar you have to use because it's so resonant and he found exactly where it resonates the best and he's tapping on the wood with a tuner and he's like anything in c sharp is going to be great for this guitar (laughs) which is like okay um, but I've used it on every recording since because I, if I walk into the studio with a different guitar, he's like, he's like, no, don't even, don't even take that out. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. take out the parlor guitar. Yeah. We're going to stick with that. I don't want to hear anything else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Could yeah. you just, um, could you I, just hold it up again? Sorry. I just for the, for, for the people watching, because I mean, it's absolutely gorgeous and then hold it on its side so we can see your guitar support. Yeah. Aha. This is a 
Yeah, it's a, a guitar. Yeah, guitar. Yeah, yeah. I love them. Yeah. I have them on all my guitars. So, so all the classical players are just like, oh, yeah, we've all got those. Yeah, yeah. It just yeah, uh, really. The slotted headstock, which is really nice. And That's it lovely. really plays like a classical guitar. And I really wanted that because, you know, the string spacing and the size of the neck, it's very similar. It's a little smaller than a classical guitar, but it's very close. And mm -hmm. I don't know all the details because I'm, you know, I'm just like it looks nice and it plays nice and yeah, it sounds good. That's all we need um, to know. <laughs> yeah, but they they built that for me and you know I've been playing that again since 2016 and it just mm -hmm. keeps opening up and it's a and any tunings really uh, it's just gorgeous and now that I have it in standard like I said before it's down a half step and it just resonates beautifully and the sustain on the guitar is ridiculous. Mm. It's just it it just doesn't quit. Nice. So it's it's and it's just great to use in the studio and. Um, you know, on live too, it it just sounds great. It has a K and K pickup in it, mm -hmm. so that's the main guitar. I have, I just got a McAllister guitar. Not me. It's funny. No, not me. Yeah, not you. <laughs> uh, Roy McAllister's a builder, I believe, out in Washington. Ah, okay. Um, and David Crosby plays McAllisters, and he had, he had made me. I was with David once, and he had all his guitars, and he had asked me to. He's like, you need to play these guitars, yeah. and he had me play a couple of them, and and. I was like, these are gorgeous, and I'll never own one because they're, you know, yeah, they're expensive. I can imagine. But I was able to, uh, with David, get my hands on one, and, and it's again, it's a twelve fret, but it is beautiful. It is just he he builds amazing instruments, just nice. a gorgeous, gorgeous guitar. Ah. So I'm starting to play that a lot as well. And okay. I have a Spohn, which also Max Spohn is a builder in Germany, ah. a young guy in his twenties. Beautiful, beautiful guitars. Mm. Beautiful guitars. Mm. Nice. Uh, those are my main three guitars. And are they, so obviously it's the, how do I say it? Is it a Fursch? Is that the? I, yeah, Furk, Furch, Furch, Furch yeah. something like and that. That's, yeah. the, that's the Czech guitar. <laughs> that's what we hear on three evenings, right? Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's the only guitar I've used since the When the Sea Let's Go album. So that's okay. like, it's been on four or five records. So Beautiful. Yeah. And that's what you recorded yeah. The Tree Still Thinks of Tom on. Yes. And, yep. and also for us here in the gallery. Yes, Brilliant. with <laughs> with the uh, guitar stand. With a yes. proper posture. Yeah, yeah excellent. <laughs> well, listen, um, Vincent, it has been amazing to chat to you. Um, and I'm so delighted to have, have managed to get you on because, um, like I say, you're the first steel string player we've had on the gallery. And I've always been really a fan of your music. And thank you for making such it. beautiful music and for sharing it with us. And thanks for chatting to us about your influences and background. It's been a real pleasure. I'm honoured. I'm honoured to finally meet you in sort of you know virtually, virtually. but uh, well, just to I mean to do this was it's a great honor because I know some of the players and people that you talk to it's just it was scary when I realized like oh boy what am I going to say well but this this was this is wonderful I really enjoyed it appreciate it great talking to you